Ladies and gentlemen, the most transformative sport event on earth is about to begin. Those who are in the stadium are on their feet. It's just a long, niggly climb. Because it is desperation now. And there it is. Gold. What a result. Another remarkable athlete about to write another chapter in Paralympic history. Hello and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. If you love the games, we are the show for you. Each week we share stories from athletes and people behind the scenes to help you have more fun watching the games. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you? Once again, not as good as you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And coming to you from the land of refrigeration, uh, I don't know how loud it's going to get on your end or if you hear anything. There's Again, I'm in a media room at the swimming trials, so there is going to be some noise in the background that's just unavoidable. There's no place to go here. We're talking about the trial. I've been here one day. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> It's an amazing testament for us, but it overwhelmed in a good way. It, it, it overwhelmed in a, oh my gosh, I'm glad I had this practice. Overwhelmed in a, oh my gosh, this is amazing kind of way. So Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that later in the show. But first. Exactly, exactly. First, we are talking about wheelchair basketball today, which is also exciting. And I have a tie into that in my swim trials report. So this is quite appropriate. Uh, we are talking with Brian Bell, who plays wheelchair basketball for Team USA. He is a two-time gold medalist, and Paris will be his third Paralympics. We met Brian at the Team USA Media Summit in April, and he came back for a longer chat. Take a listen. Brian Bell, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to talk wheelchair basketball. Yeah, I'm excited as well. Thank you. So let's start with the very basics for people who really haven't seen wheelchair basketball before. What are the major differences between able-bodied and wheelchair basketball? Yeah, so some of the key differences would be there's no double dribble in wheelchair basketball. For like the traveling call, it would be every two pushes, you have to take a dribble. And that's kind of like the main rules, like three seconds in a key if you're offense, all the other nuances of the game is pretty much the same, the same length of the court, same height of the uh, um, hoop, all that stuff is still the same. So just only a small, slight differences. Okay. The same height of the hoop means that you are hurling that basketball a much further distance. Yeah. When you're able-bodied and you shoot basketball, a lot of that power is coming from your legs. So mm -hmm. where is that shooting power coming from when you're sitting in a wheelchair? Well, it's all arms. Uh, we do everything with the arms in the wheelchair. <laughs> I know it's uh, like, oh, well, of course, duh. You, you're not using your legs. But yeah, you have to do everything. You have to generate power uh, with pushing, stopping, and then, of course, shooting. So everything is with arms. So a lot of upper body workouts, movement, all that type of stuff. How much protection and injuries are happening to wrists and shoulders? Um, you do see a lot of injuries, especially like shoulder type injuries in wheelchair basketball, just because of like throwing long passes or trying to reach a long pass if, if someone's throwing it to you. So there can be a lot of lot of kind of shoulder roll, uh, rotator cuff injuries that kind of associate with wheelchair basketball. I would think for a lot of the pushing, you would want to have something protecting your hands, but you can't because you're also handling the basketball. So how are you just physically dealing with the stress on your hands? Yeah, it's, I like to uh, say that when you're first trying with your basketball, it's definitely uh, really hard on your hands. So I feel like when someone gets in a chair and they start pushing around, go through it for like 30 minutes or so, they start to feel like spots on the hands, like a little bit of like bruising. And it kind of comes with it. So the more and more you train, like the more and more your hands get used to it, kind of builds up calluses. Some of those pain points and spots don't really affect you as much um, later in your career as you get. So therefore, it's a little bit easier in that regards. But yeah, it takes a lot of like practice and preparation in terms of like getting used to it. Yeah, like you said, it's better to not have things on your hands because you need to actually feel the ball, you know, 
especially like what types of forms and how people grip the ball when they're shooting, all that stuff kind of goes into the factor. So for shooting and obviously able-bodied basketball height's a big issue. Mm-hmm. You want to be very, very tall. Does a taller torso help you in wheelchair basketball in that same way? Taller torsos in wheelchair basketball is a tremendous benefit for sure. People who have longer torsos usually dominate the game just because they can sit in a chair and shoot way higher over like their opponents. So it's much easier for them to get baskets uh, or take shots and get shots off over other uh, of the other opponents. So it definitely helps tremendously for sure in a wheelchair. Okay, so I'm a failure in any kind of basketball, is what we're saying here. <laughs> There's always roles and stuff. You just, you know, ro- ro- role players, like, you know, ball handlers, you know, playmakers, no, all the time. My, my role will be the ball girl, Brian. Okay. Let's, let's, <laughs> not, let's not even pretend. <laughs> so but then, then do people who have longer torsos, do they have fun with shorter torso people? And by fun, I mean, like, little taunting going on i would say occasionally yeah it's a very competitive sport it's definitely once you get to the higher stages like you know representing your country at the Paralympics, there you definitely get to the point of uh, sometimes you know trash talking taunting all that does play into the fact that you know some other countries do it more than others but you do occasionally get that you, you know you want to take advantage of the mismatch but our team, I would say, for the most part, don't try to like rub it in, but most people do try to take advantage of a height mismatch. Okay, put a pin in the trash talking. We're going to go back to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about the wheelchair. Mm-hmm. What makes it different than your everyday chair? So some of the key differences would be the wheels are slanted inward. So that kind of helps with kind of rotating and spinning quickly there's wheels on the back i know some everyday chairs have wheels on the back for like preventing from um falling backwards but competition basketball chairs definitely have to have it for the fact of you know you're going in really fast and you're leaning back with passes you know you trying to avoid falling over potentially hitting your head or getting type of head injuries um and then click straps on the chair that keeps you in the chair I want to say that it's kind of like a comparison of like shoes for like able-bodied people. It would be, you want to make sure your shoes are tight. So the shoes don't fall off your feet when you're running. So it's the same thing with you would be in the chair. You want to make sure the chair is tight, snug, and you're able to control the chair as much as possible as you're playing the game. I think that's kind of the key differences compared to an everyday chair. How high does it come up against your back? It depends of classification. Some people need a little bit higher backrests just for the fact of stability. For me being the highest class in our sport, most four, four fives need minimal backrests. So usually my backrests probably come up to like, I want to say like right above like my hip, maybe like two inches or so. Oh, wow. So, not, so you, not, need a, you need a lot of core strength. To yes, also maintain exactly. position. So usually when you're a higher class, you have a higher core front like strength. So that way you don't need as much, you know, support with the backrest, all that stuff uh, with it. So you're able to control your chair a little bit more, more easily compared to some of the lower class. Are you wearing a shoe? I am young wearing a shoe, yeah. When I'm playing, yes. Okay, so what what is that shoe go? I mean, I know what it's doing. <laughs> what is it consisting of? In terms of like functionality or just, you know, or, how is it right, different than a street shoe? What would be special about that for you? I would say it's just a normal basketball shoe. Uh, I normally wear Nikes mainly because it's it's one of my favorite shoes growing up. Also, it's one of my sponsors too. But I like to wear shoes that I find that are meaningful or uh, have like a good design on them um, in terms of like look good, play good type of feel. But for the functionality, no, the shoe doesn't really do anything when you're sitting down in a chair. But I think for like rules, you have to have shoes on just in case of like injuries, like maybe a fifth wheel landing inside the chair on a foot or something. You have to have some type of protection. 
Has anybody ever showed up to practice and forgotten their shoes and have to wear like loafers? Oh, all the time. I even do it all the time. Like it just like I've thought that I put my shoes in the bag and then I didn't, and then I have slides on or Crocs on and I have to play in those. So it definitely happens. It happens to the best of like everyone. So it's, it's just you got like you just kind of got to go with it. You have to play with it. So are players allowed to wear prosthetics? They are allowed to wear prosthetics, yeah. A lot of, not a lot, but some people will find it more comfortable and they have more control of the chair when they're prosthetic. Or they have a prosthetic like sleeve built on that chair. So then they can have even greater control of the chair. So not only having, you know, pushing off their good leg, they're also able to push off their nub as well. Um, so a lot of people use prosthetics for that reason. Okay, do you? I do not. I've definitely been asked to do so, but I just didn't feel the need for it. So how come on both questions, like how, why do people want you to and why do you not want to? Uh, for that very reason that I said earlier, the fact that you could have more control of the chair because your nub is not just kind of free flowing. So that's why they suggest doing that. But the reason why I don't do it is because I feel like I don't need like an overall protection for like the nub to do that control. I can still push off the nub on like the bars that's like right there in front. So I don't need like all that extra protection weight or whatever on my chair. Do you need to focus on training in terms of keeping your body balanced as an amputee, even when it's your upper body? Yeah, I do. But it is being an amputee, we do utilize our legs a fair amount in our chair. Like I said, like kind of pushing off in our chair. So we do do a lot of like lower body legs in our workouts, not to the extent of some of our non-disabled athletes or Olympians, but we do still have to work that muscle because we don't want to be like super, super big on top and then have skinny legs. You know, that looks weird. So, (laughs) (laughs) so, but not wearing the prosthetic that makes you lighter. So does that make you faster? In the sense, yes, it can with any type of like equipment and stuff like that. It, you're always trying to find ways to be lighter, faster. So you have to kind of play with that a little bit. So do you want to put a prosthetic sleeve on or wear your prosthetic to have more you know, control, but you lose a little bit of speed to have that control? Or do you want to do it the other way? So it just kind of depends. It's a lot of kind of playing with it, fine tuning, like chair setup that kind of goes into it. I want to know with the three second rule and you've got a whole bunch of chairs, is it part of strategy to try to block somebody in the key? I mean, it's hard to get out of there. Yeah, it can be, but sometimes it kind of can be a negative at times because as long as you're actively trying to get out of the key, it, they won't call you for three seconds uh, necessarily, but you do try to like keep people in and that maybe you have them, force a certain way so like maybe force and overcrowd one section so they have to go out the other side of the key so then like everyone's more on one side so there's some type of strategy involved but for the most part usually that's not it's not the case that you can get you could get like a bunch of three second calls by just trapping someone in a key like as long as you're trying to actively get out then the refs won't call it so question of classification 14 points or fewer are allowed at the court at any one time. And when we talked earlier, you were saying people don't have positions per se. Yeah, it's more right. based on the classification. So I want to go back and talk about that. Yeah, I would say that the classifications, you can kind of put positions on the classifications. Like I said before in our previous thought, that four, four, fives are kind of like the centers, power fours uh, for the most part. But they can be point forwards or be able to handle the balls and stuff like that. But they're primarily like power forwards and centers. And then as you go down the list, three fives, threes, two fives, all that, they can be the small fours, they can be the um, power forwards, and then, you know, lower, later, later, the shooting guards, the point guards, and so forth with like the twos, one fives, one os. So it kind of like goes by that. But again, in our sport, it, it doesn't necessarily 
be defined with just those. Like for me, I can, like I said, be a point four. I can handle the ball. I can be a big guy. I can be a shooter from outside. It just kind of depends on what type of players you have, or what type of like combination of people you want on the court to kind of get the job done in terms of like strategy wise playing against their opponent. So when your coach is planning a strategy, you know, a lot of basketball coaches have a philosophy. You know, I run these kind of plays and these kind of mm-hmm. plays. Is wheelchair basketball more personnel specific? I would say for my coach, I would say it's a little bit of both. I would say he's more, he, he puts the right players out there to, you know, with their specialties, but he also puts the right overall team out on the court that work well together. So yeah, you're going to have your specialties like shooters, mainly people who play make for other people, big guys, but it's just a combination of what group of guys work best. I know that in the past, some of the uh, previous um, teams were decided more on, let's just pick all the best, you know, talent, all the best players, but they didn't necessarily maybe played well together or have that cohesion. So like, once, like, I, once the start of our like winning spurt, I would say our coaches at that time and still now were more focused on the right group of guys that play well together, that still are top talent, but also play well together in a cohesive manner. More so, just throwing a bunch of top athletes out there and seeing what happens, and then trying to like go from there. Well, it's the same controversy that happens in able-bodied basketball, right? You know, do you have an all-star team or do you put a team together? Yes. That same dichotomy going Mm -hmm. and and tension. Yep. What do you all do to build that cohesion, especially with different, I mean, there's got to be different types of lines that go out and you have to work with different groups all the time. Yeah, I would say, uh, like, think it back to when we kind of started the winning phase or whatever, I would say it was kind of uh, two things. First, it was sports psychology, I would say, played a big factor in it. You know, you're bringing in a lot of different personalities, characters together. So kind of getting closer in terms of how people think, um, you know, their weaknesses, their strengths, like what they think their weaknesses, strengths are. Um, And then all of us knowing that also just how close we were off the court, like just doing everything together, just talking hanging out, laughing, watching sports together. We did consider ourselves a brotherhood and, and, and a family. Even to this day, like we still keep in touch with, with everyone, even back like until 2016. And then also just the coaches putting us in practice positions to work with each other, to learn, to actively keep working. So it becomes more second nature. I know that like now, like our core lineup that potentially we will start is like a lot of the guys from 2016 when we won the first initial time so we have a lot of that chemistry already built up like we know what each other is going to do even before we necessarily do it um so it's a lot of that trying to get into that mindset with some of the newer guys that we have like getting back to that like running us through a bunch of practices and making sure that we fine-tune like what is each other's like tendencies habits so we can get used to it so then like even though we're communicating uh we don't necessarily necessarily have to do it like respond to communication responding to like actually knowing what they're going to do on top of just communication by itself do you ever find yourself parenting your younger teammates (laughs) as a vet now it definitely kind of comes with the territory so yes and then of course being a dad so it definitely comes out quite often of Especially, you know, you're, you're competitive, you want to win, even in practices like different lineups, you want to win. So any type of moment I can get, I'm trying to at least let the person I'm directly working with and also the whole um, team or that five know what I'm seeing, what I want to like try to do in certain situations, certain moments, especially with some of the newer guys are kind of thrown into the mix of some of the newer lineups and I'm still getting to know what their tendencies are and trying to get to know what they uh, prefer in terms of position on the court, how they set up their shot. So it's always a lot of communication, especially early days uh, when forming a new team, especially like gearing up to the Paralympics. 
You almost have a starting five of your own, Brian. <sighs> no. <laughs> <laughs> not, please. I am not encouraging that. Yeah. I, that's why I said, like, I have a starting five now, and then I'll be a player coach that comes off the bench. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> So I want to go back to some controversy back in Tokyo about the reclassification. And so prior to Tokyo, the IPC Mm. had some things to say about wheelchair basketball. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that controversy first come to the team? So to the best of my knowledge, I believe that it was the IWF and IPC were aligned on like classification or like the IPC gave them like the recommendation or classification that they wanted to have. And then I don't know if the IWF didn't get back to them soon enough or something of that matter, then they kind of like basically hardball the IWF to like, you have to do this or you're not going to go type of thing. So then that kind of, you know, started like everyone has to be reclassified into this classification system. I believe that's what I was told and how I kind of gather of the situation. Uh, it was just kind of like a little misconnect with communication or maybe just not seeing eye to eye or on top of like how they want to do the classification. But again, IPC rules out because we want to go to the Paralympics. So um, you kind of have to do what they <laughs> suggest. Uh, so, yeah. So unexpectedly, you have to be reclassified yeah. because obviously your disability it was not going to change. Yes. But how did that happen in terms of the lead up to, to Tokyo? And what was that process like? So our staff were pretty on top of it. A doctor coordinated with um, the IPC people with classif- classifiers on our side. I know at the time, like we filled out a whole bunch of paperwork again, like went to the doctor and make sure that is verified that I do have a disability or any other type of documentation to class to uh, classify my disability i got on like a virtual call with them sat in a chair because you know those right during the pandemic so we can like actually see people in person and then you know they saw me in a chair they saw me without my prosthetic with my prosthetic on all that type of jazz and it's basically just another classification type uh, thing that you do in a tournament but just virtually and then just doing the whole process all over um i know the tough thing about it was a lot of athletes got classed out because they have very minimal dis- disabilities, which was tough and hard because, you know, we are a growing sport. We don't just have a, a plethora of just disabled athletes that we just throw in the chairs, especially like top caliber athletes. So it definitely eliminated a lot of top athletes from a lot of different countries. Were you ever concerned for yourself? I was not because, you know, missing the entire leg kind of puts me in that category. It was more for like maybe like ACL tears, like people like that, like barely kind of make it on that classification uh, spectrum. So for me, I, I was never worried. Like I'm missing a whole leg. So <laughs> if there's you, an issue are, there, then it's just high. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a four, four point four five, five, right? Yeah. yeah. When that happens and that disrupts the team and disrupts the tournament, how did that affect the play? I would say it didn't affect the play too negatively. I know there was a lot of like petitioning and kind of semi boycotting going on leading up to it because some of the like, teammates or players that I got classed out in different countries uh, wanted to protest. And they even like on other national team people, players, teammates, staff, whoever – even, you know, sign that protest because we want our sport to grow. Like, we don't care if they have very minimal disabilities to play. As long as they're competitive, the top athletes, it makes our sport look stronger, that we don't care. But we definitely, you know, signed that movement. And then, you know, nothing came of it because IPC often makes kind of the overall rules judgment for the Paralympic sport. So you have to live with it and... You know, just had to go into the tournament knowing that we did try as best as we can. Like even we didn't have anyone on our side get classified out, but it was mainly other countries. And we still signed those petitions and try to help and voice our uh, opinion in that movement. But again, if it doesn't happen, we try our best and then we just move forward. 
Yeah, it's interesting just because you can only have so many fours and 4.5s on the court at one time, or even on, and you don't want to stack your team with 4.5s because you can't put five people on the court. So it's just kind of interesting how that became a a thing. Mm -hmm. No, very interesting for sure. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how the sport has grown since your first appearance in the Paralympics in 2016. So what are you seeing now that was different than eight years ago? I would say for sure more coverage of the Paralympic sport in general. I know London was kind of like the kickstart of it. I wasn't in London, but I heard a lot of people talk about how well London did the Paralympics, especially for like advertising and promoting and just bringing awareness to it. And I think the lead up to Rio was kind of the same thing. NBC uh, was a big factor in like making sure that they televised not just the Olympics, but also the Paralympic um, Games as well on, on TV. And then it's progressively got more and more. So now they, we, they televise even more sports. They have more opportunities for people to see all types of different sports at the Paralympics. Now I feel like that was kind of a really, really big moving driver because most people, they know of the Paralympics, but they don't always get the chance to see it especially firsthand. And that was kind of the biggest thing when I am asked about like my sport is that they don't know about it or they've never seen it. And I feel like for the most part, when first people see our sport, like truly see top level competition, they fall in love with it. They see how intense it is. They see how much effort is put into going up and down, how much technique, talent it is to shoot a basketball at the same distance and same hoop height as the Olympians, like all that factors. So it's definitely improved uh, with the awareness part. I feel like there's more awareness in terms of getting sponsorships for the Paralympic side. I feel like that intensified more and more. It also helped after Rio getting the same prize money for winning medals as the Olympians was a big one because for the longest time, it wasn't the same. It was, I think, 50,000 for Olympians and then like five for Paralympians. So now that evened out. So like small little things like that to kind of keep us on the same playing field because we put in the same amount of work as Olympians as, as well. So we should definitely, you know, get the same type of awards, promotions, all that stuff that comes with it. Talk a little bit about Rio, because we definitely got mixed stories about what was happening down there. Okay. Uh, What stories did you hear? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the money ran out before the Paralympics. Ah, okay. (laughs) So how were you taken care of? How did it feel? What was that situation like? Did you feel it as a player? I would say I didn't feel it as much as a player. I also feel like... In our, specifically talking about wheelchair basketball, I feel like in our sport, it's not a very like, oh, you're going to get a lot of money like type of sport. So it's more of kind of a sacrifice to play wheelchair basketball than anything. So like, oh, we ran out of money. Okay, well, we're used to that. That's nothing new. So it, I don't think it really affected us uh, going in. There was never really a thought or, or thing on our mind. It was just more just us playing basketball because we never, in the first place, got a lot of money to play in our sports anyway. For the most part, we we're more sacrificing time, money, all that stuff to play our sport and represent our country at that stage. Speaking of money, <laughs> as you said, it's, I mean, you're not making a fortune playing wheelchair basketball. Yeah. You have a family, you have to balance earning money, you have to balance training. So what does that look like for you day to day? It's definitely before I got a full-time job, it was definitely was challenging. That's the kind of reason why I went to go play overseas to play with your basketball because at least that way I'm getting paid a, enough to you know get by, maybe save a little bit. And then also they pay for a lot of the kind of utilities, house, car, some of the bills usually. So then that way there's less bills. It's more just focus on basketball and then still getting you know a decent wage. Um, now that I'm working full time, it helps like having a full time job. So now I don't necessarily need to rely on trying to find money through basketball. I have that with my full time work. But now I'm working full time. It's making it a more challenge to work out, to train, to do all that stuff that I was accustomed to playing professionally and only having basketball, you know, be the kind of focal point and 100 percent focus. How have you changed in the time span? You've been doing this a while. Yeah. How do you feel like you've changed as a player? 
I would say I definitely I matured. Like I feel like early on when I first initially started playing, I was definitely like go 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 fast 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 fast. Like just don't stop pushing. I do tend to still do that, but I feel like now I'm older. I like pick my times when I do it rather than just constantly doing it and like tiring myself off, tiring myself um out early. So definitely mature in that, using my speed more wisely, and then kind of more fine tuning specific shots that I want to get for myself. So like, like being able to generate shots for myself at a given time rather than back then it was more I was a diver I was more just setting up my shooters behind me for shots and then roll in for easy layups or easy post-ups on like lower class so I feel like now I've more evolved like I'm, I could be an outside shooter I could be more of a scorer on top of being also a big guy center power forward that type of thing. Let's talk about the 2024 Paralympic tournament coming up. So we've got <laughs> defending gold medalist Team USA. Who else should we be paying attention to? There's a lot of tough teams. Now that there's only eight teams now, there's really no no easy games, I would say. Of course, GB, Great Britain is our top competitors like, since back when, 2016, 2017. Um, there's always been kind of the people that we either struggle with in pool play or, or, you know, had difficult games with them in friendlies. So they're definitely a top competitor. Netherlands uh, has a good team. Germany has a good team. Um, there's a lot of good teams out there. I, I would never say that it's just going to be a cakewalk because everyone's going to give us our best, their best shot, as they should. And that's what we prefer. Like, we don't want, like, easy games. We, we love when it's very competitive and less of a blowout with some of the kind of, like, more developing teams. So it's going to be it's gonna be fun. It's going to be tough, but it's going to be it's gonna be fun and awesome playing the literally top, top eight teams in the world. I told you to put a pin in the trash talking, so I want to <laughs> know who's the trash talkers and can you trash talk in multiple languages? <laughs> Let's see. There's not really a lot of trash talkers on our team. Uh, we kind of more lead with our actions or talk with our actions, I would say. more Or more like nonverbal trash talking, like shaking a head or stuff like that. Or like, you know, why did you leave me open, like shaking head type of thing. Uh, some of our shooters do that occasionally. But I wouldn't say a, not a lot of like verbal, verbal trash talking. Unless like it has to be like really, really excessive, like, someone talking back to our teammates so then we're talking to them or something like that but yeah i feel like we try to avoid doing that because that's kind of plays into the other team's plan or more mindset of like trying to like rattle you distract you you talking back um i would say that a few of us can if necessary need to talk back or trash talk in different languages i feel like a lot of us have played in Italy, so we know a little bit of Italian. A few of us know French. I'm trying to think. A lot of us know Spanish because we have a lot of kind of semi white Mexican people on our team. So a lot of us know know Spanish. So we can kind of get our point across in, in different languages. <laughs> um, for other teams across the world, I would say they do rely on trash talk or more because I think think it's like an extra tactic, like I mentioned earlier, of trying to distract their opponent and kind of get the extra edge on them, especially in like a tight, in a close game or a tight game. I was very disappointed when I met you and you said you never <laughs> palm somebody's head. I so know. Have you gone and done that now in the couple I, weeks? I, I have not. I, I've, Bro, I've not had the pleasure on. of palming someone's head. I don't Did think you palm, anyone's... Wait, do you palm your children's head? Yeah. I would say not necessarily palm, but like I would grab their head, like, but I wouldn't say palm. Like palm <laughs> is like grabbing and then like moving around forcefully. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that, no. But because maybe I should do it at some point as like a TikTok thing or like Instagram yes, thing. For and me, then I'll, Brian. I'll send it to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> because okay, I have hands that are proportionate to the size of my body. I can yeah. barely hold a golf ball. Yeah. So if my hand I think it's the jealousy. I'm like, okay. oh, just to be able to grab things. Yeah. yeah. It, I can't do that. But if it helps, I, I have incorporated that quite a bit in my game as of late, just palming the ball. I appreciate that. Aspects. So 
At least I do that. But yes, I need to work on palming someone's head. And speaking, of your, speaking of your kids, what do they think of all of this? And are they going to be with you in Paris? Some of them will be in Paris. Uh, it will be a lot, very expensive, and also probably a nightmare slash headache for my wife to deal with, travel with all of them. So I think she hasn't completely decided yet, but I think maximum two, and then most likely one. And then she's also debating baby just leaving all the kids with her parents and then just coming along. So it's it's either one of those three options of them. But the kids love watching me play, especially when I was overseas, them coming to all the games. Granted, half the time they don't have the attention span to sit there and watch a whole game. They're more of like the amenities that comes with, you know, playing professionally. Like, oh, they have a bouncy house in the stadium. So they're just bouncing for like hours in there or they go into the concession stand or they're playing any other games that they have to kind of entertain the kids at, at those events. But they, they do love watching me play. And it's a joy when they, when I see how much, how excited they are for me, especially when I win, uh, they talk about me it's to their classmates all the time. I've done a few assemblies at their school so it's they talk about me probably all the time maybe a little too much because I'm every time I pick them up from, from school the, all the that I see is like a bunch of kids just pointing and like oh, this <laughs> is assembly. he's from so it's like yeah it's my dad he you know he's plays with your basketball for team I say like that type of stuff but is that is definitely very cool and I appreciate it do, do the medals go to show and tell a lot they do. It's. I feel like it's kind of a, a necessity. Uh, if I'm doing like any type of simile, I feel like that's kind of the, the thing that they, people ask um, if I don't have just on hand all the time. And they like they always ask like, so you just bring them everywhere, right? It's like no, that would just be too much <laughs> to bring everywhere. But I do bring them to assemblies like that because I feel like that's always a question like, oh, so do you have the medals with you? It's like. Of course, I, I I have them with me for these type of things. Just wear them all the time, Brian. Like Flav Flav with the watch. I know. <laughs> I feel like I did not have like neck problems, and I don't want that because <laughs> they they are pretty heavy. They're surprisingly heavy. What is it like playing professionally? And obviously, it's overseas. But then coming home. I mean, what's the atmosphere like in those games versus at home? There, it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's 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 awesome. It's Kind of the, one of the main reasons why I wanted to go over there because I've heard so many good things about how professional the leagues are over in Europe um, and how big the fan base is. And I was fortunate enough to be on two teams that had really, really great fan base and had stadiums that pretty much filled up all, completely. And they were really, really loud. They brought drums, they brought like horns, they brought all that type of stuff. And you could just, you know, hear the the energy, the excitement throughout the whole stadium. And I love that. And that that, that type of stuff only got at the Paralympics. Um, so to actually get it there and then, you know, all the time was amazing. Um, but then, of course, moving back now, you know, have a full-time job, uh, more playing, more, I guess you could say, recreational, like, league here, you know, don't have as strong of a fan base. And, and it's due to a lot of things, like a lot of competing sports in the U.S. Like, we have all types of professional sports to, you know, the top level all the way to cornhole, to darts, to all types of stuff. So it's a lot of competing sports, especially, like, things that are televised. So it's just a lot harder to get, like, fan base awareness and stuff in the states do you think there's down the road a potential for developing something that's a little bigger than recreational i think so it just takes a lot of work i know in the past we did have something league that was when we i think had like affiliation with like some of the nba teams back in the day so that helps i feel like if we can get maybe back to like doing something like that um, more having like a um, affiliation with NBA teams and then making teams that way. And then we can get some of the top players over um, in Europe or across the world to come to the States. And then that way, you know, we have top level competition, top level games. Um, and then also we have a top promoter like the NBA 
to kind of back it and have that fan base, maybe even like occasionally play games like in those stadiums, that type of stuff. If we can get back to that, that would be, of course, amazing. But I know like in the past with some leadership previously, it's fallen out, it's like all types of stuff that the NWA has to work with, especially like now the leadership now has to work with, with some of the previous mistakes and kind of pitfalls that have to kind of mend. And it's definitely going in the right direction, but it will take time. Do you ever just hustle a pickup game and people don't know who you are? <laughs> I would say no, not really. Not anymore. I know in college I used to play like standing up quite a bit, but no, I don't I don't do that very often. I do of course go to the twenty four hour fitness or like I, I open gyms to shoot and do all that type of stuff. And then of course I get the occasional person come up to me like oh you have a nice form or i see you like put in a lot of work on um, then they ask like who i pay for and then i tell them and then they're like oh really you pay for team usa like i didn't even know that, that type of stuff so no that's always cool but also i'm trying to you know work out and shoot so it kind of gets <laughs> annoying at times but it is fun it is cool though to kind of get people's you know opinions words so. Do you feel the burden of having to be kind of a Paralympic ambassador, an ambassador for wheelchair basketball in a way that able-bodied athletes don't have to? No, I wouldn't say it's a burden per se. Um, I feel like if people are, are willing to come up to me and ask questions, I'm definitely open to answer them, to inform them, even give them chances or opportunities of where they can watch basketball or wheelchair basketball in certain areas because like i said the awareness needs to be better in that area so if any type of things that i can do to help with that i'm game and i'm willing to do so so yeah no burden at all did we miss anything about wheelchair basketball that people should know if i didn't say it already it's really really awesome you should definitely watch it (laughs) <laughs> the, that's, that's the thing we're excited to see it in paris yeah we're, so brian bell thank you so much for joining us we're excited to see you in paris thank you thank you guys for having me it was awesome it's fun thank you so much brian you can find brian on insta at b underscore bell 1308 and on x at b underscore bell 13 so you know what else came out today no the 3x3 basketball schedule for Paris. Oh my gosh, that is exciting. So that means we'll be making some updates to our viewing guide, the ebook with the whole Olympic and Paralympic schedule, medal tables, event times and places. So you can figure out if you're going, if you want to try and snap up some extra tickets, or when you're sitting at home figuring out what you want to watch. The viewing guide is available as an ebook on Amazon and Apple Books. We'll have links to that in the show notes. You can also find those links at our homepage, flamealivepod.com. And I want to add that we've been I've been seeing like little, oh, here's your viewing guide for Paris, and it'll have a chart which has what days medal events are on for every sport. We break it down by time so that you can figure out in at a glance version what time you need to be watching what when. That I think is one benefit of our ebook is that there's a visual representation of Hey, this sport, you could have five sports on one day. Oh, you're probably going to have 29 sports on one day. Let's, let's be real. It's going to be like 20 sports on one day, but they're not going to all be nine to two. We break it out. And if you have Kindle Unlimited on Amazon, our book is included in that for free. So please do check it out. We will have links to that in the show notes. And also you can find a graphic on our website that will point you right to it. La piscine est grande. <laughs> La piscine est grande. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at a big swimming pool every day for, for a few days. <laughs> uh, we've got a little bit of Paris 2024 news, starting with the fact that there have been 25 individ- individuals invited to join the individual neutral athletes designation. These are athletes from Russia and Belarus, who have met quotas, I would say, for different sports. Russia and Belarus are not coming as a team, as countries. They will not be there because of the Olympic truce that Russia has broken. So now we are starting to see that 
yes, there may in fact be neutral athletes at these games. Well, more I think most of them are in wrestling, but there are a few scattered around other sports. Yeah, a lot of federations banned Russian athletes and Belarusian athletes from competing at events that would have earned them quota spots or earned the points needed to qualify. But wrestling was not one of those. So we won't see athletes in a lot of other sports, not because they didn't meet the neutral athlete qualifications that the IOC put forth, but because they were never able to qualify. Let's keep on the so-so news and talk about uh, heavy rains that have been in France lately. And so what does that mean? The River Seine has unsafe elevated levels of E. coli, according to a published report by monitoring group Eau de Paris. And I think that's make of what you will. I believe those have been lower than they have been in the past, but we still have issues. And if there are, if there are heavy rains in July and August, this could be a problem, but we'll have to see about that. This is just going to be a wait and see. We really don't know how this is going to play out. And it's unfortunate that they don't seem to have a real viable plan B to move the swimming. The, the plan B is it becomes a duathlon. For the triathlon, and then, you know, they have some backup days for open water swimming. But even then, I don't know if they have a backup plan to put the open water swimming anywhere else. Right. So this is, unlike Zika, I actually think this is going to be a, a story that matters because it affects the actual events and the athletes may or may not be able to participate in the Olympics in the way that they expected. Speaking of the Sen, the opening ceremonies had a test event on the Sen. Well, it's not a test event, but they're testing the Parade of Nation boats. And so they did a 55 boat parade on June 17th, and they're going to do a longer one as well. So what they were talking about is getting the timing exactly right to have these boats go down the Sen. And that's going to be critical because if they don't go down the Sen at the right moments, well, A, whatever performance elements are blended in, those get thrown off. And I mean, you've got such a long waterway that you're dealing with. If one thing, you know, it's just a ripple effect down. If it Quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the Sen is a living, breathing thing. It's not static. It moves. It There are literally things living in there. So to include this element in the opening ceremony, we knew was a risk on many levels, but now we're finding out risk that, that we certainly didn't think about like, oh, if the Sen is moving at a faster or slower pace that day, what do you have to do to compensate for that? It's like wind assisted, but in a, in a much more complex way. So we could see some real interesting timing and I don't know if American television will catch that because they'll be showing the, the opening ceremony on tape delay. So American viewers may miss out on some of these quirks, but we will be there in well, some way and well, we will find some quirks. And I bet they will have the ceremonies live, but I think it's going to be like when you see stuff on TV, it's flattened out or they have enough directors watching enough monitors to be able to time it differently and you won't see the issues that happen because they will jump to another part of the river or the stadium area. So that'll be interesting. Party.blog has reported that there's going to be a Korea house at Maison de la Chimie, an Art Deco style international conference center in the heart of Paris. It will be within a 15 minute walk of the urban sports cluster, the Grand Palais, which has fencing and Taekwondo and the uh, Invalides, which has archery and, and some of the road races and cycling will be around there as well. We don't have a ton of information about it. It's supposed to be open to the public, but it looks like tickets will be involved. So we will have information for you as it becomes available. All right. I'm here at swimming trials. Speaking of getting ready for Paris. We don't have a sounder for a wave, but we'll just go <laughs> whoosh. <laughs> uh, so it is at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, which is the home to the Indianapolis Colts American football team. I am in the media center, which is a two-story deal. If you have been to a football stadium, I am in one of those club sections. Uh, if you have a nicer ticket and you get access to your own dedicated concession stands, and then there's a lounge area. So this is a two-floor situation. Uh, I am in the bottom floor right now, ground level. And it's got one, two, three or four concession stand areas. So take that as how, that's how big the media center is. 
uh, we've got like, it's three to four tables long, the big folding eight foot tables. And then there's about 10, 10 rows of tables or so. So that's, and then behind me is a little roped off press conference area. And behind that's the women's bathroom, <laughs> which is was a struggle through, to find wander through pipe and drape avoid all the audio equipment that's there for the for the press conferences and then uh wander back and find the bathroom are those tables all full in the evening sessions like are you really how much press are you seeing um there is a fair amount here there's also we have tabled seating indoors we are located on the start line area but we are if we're looking at the pool we're kind of to the right of the pool so it's not necessarily a great location for watching we can't see the finish line very well even though we're right there at the start you can't see down to see who finishes uh, listener patrick from chicagoland was here yesterday and i got i got to meet him that was so exciting and he actually had really good seats along it, just because all the fans are on the they run the length of the pool for the most part. There is fan seating at either end of the pool, but the majority of it is along the length of the pool. And it's really spectacular to watch from there. I will say that. The good thing about where we're sitting inside the stadium is that we also can wander over to the backstage area. And the pool area takes up about half of the football field, the pool that you see on TV. That's just half of the football field. And there's curtain that separates it. Behind the curtain is another 10-lane pool, just like the one you see, plus an 8-lane 25-meter pool. So is that warm-up, cool-down? Warm-up, cool-down pools right there. So that area is like chaos. <laughs> it looks like chaos to me because of the fact that it, there are so many swimmers warming up and cooling down at any given time. Also backstage is uh, the mixed zone. And for me to get to the mixed zone, this is also great practice because I had forgotten about the rickety stairs made out of piping <laughs> that we would encounter from time to time in Beijing. <laughs> that is what we take to get down to the mixed zone. The pools are raised. There's a big platform because of course the pools have to go down to get that depth so the platforms of the pools the deck of the pool is above ground and so there's kind of ramp systems and stairs in the back that take you to the stairs that go down that take you to the mix zone area and then a ramp system that goes up to stay on the same pool deck line as the main pool i, I do have to tell you that within a minute of walking into the pool area i became obsessed with baskets and I yeah, you texted me about baskets, and I was very confused. I said, yes, I know our interview this week is basketball, but what are you talking <laughs> about baskets with swimming? This is the best. And I do want to see swimming in Paris to see if they do it as well as here. You know how when the swimmers come out and they're decked out like it's going to be a blizzard outside. So <laughs> they had to take off their gear and they put it in a basket. At their at Every lane has a chair and a basket behind it for their gear. Well... After the start goes off, a line of 13 young people, maybe middle school, maybe high school age, come out. They walk out from the backstage. They're all holding an empty basket. Well, well, I'm sorry. Eight of them are holding empty baskets. Four of them have a little towel draped over their forearm. And there is a leader. The leader leads them to the edge of the 10th lane because they have two border lanes so that it cuts down on the wave action within the pool while the swimmers are swimming. They make a kind of sharp right turn to go towards the pool, sharp left turn when they get to behind the basket area. They walk all the way down to the end of the pool. The leader raises their arm, and that is a signal for the basket people to get to work. They walk up. They take the full basket of clothing out of this little holder that's on the ground. They put the empty basket in that holder and then they go back in line the people with the towels they go to the start blocks and they wipe down two start blocks each 
Then they all get back in line. Meanwhile, while this is happening, the leader is walking from lane one all the way down to lane 10, basically. And by the time the leader gets to the end, all of that basket choreography is done. And these kids are back in line and they all walk back out. Then they go behind the stage with their baskets and they put them. There's a series of four long tables. They put the baskets on one table. Volunteers are there to kind of move them over to the next tables. And then when the swimmers are done, they come in and collect their stuff. Is this while the race is happening? While the race is happening. The start gun goes off and the baskets come out. It is so amazing. And I am missing a lot of the swimming action because I am so enthralled with baskets. They remind me of the women who were the the medal ceremony people at Beijing. Remember that choreography? Yes. It's exactly like this. It is down to a science here. It is so incredibly in sync and so amazing to watch. Then you get into the officials kind of choreography. And I haven't figured that out yet. I've got a couple more days here because I'm only staying a few days. But they also have different places to go. And at the end of the race, they all leave the pool area and go to like their screens all set up on the floor level. So they walk behind that while everything else goes on and they're getting ready for the next race. If it's something like a 400 meter race. Oh no, this, this I noticed during the 200 meter freestyle, the gun goes off and there are no judges there. There's the starter, because they've got the start. I mean, the starter, it's not a gun anymore. It's a beep. The starting beep goes off. You've got starters and, and people on the side at the start that are watching. And then you have stroke judges that are walking the lines of the pool. And there's maybe four down the pool. So they're not necessarily seeing, a, not having to look at a huge section of the pool, but they're, they're watching. Then once the swimmers go make that turn for the second length, the row of judges come out for the finish all in a line all choreographed i am just it, it is beyond it, it's just everything is precisely timed here and then you add on top of that the fact that there are 17,000 plus people in the stands all screaming how loud is it it is so loud i will i, I will try to take a, a little bit of audio if i can of the the screaming i know on Saturday night, the opening night, there were over 20,000 people here. And that was a record for a a swim meet attendance. Uh, The day session yesterday was 17,700 something. I'm not sure what the night session was, but it was packed. And people are so into it. There are so many swimmers. There was the in between races. And you can tell it's like for commercial time. They've got a couple of people like hosting things and walking around the pool, walking in the audience, shooting, you know, throwing t- t-shirts into the audience. And one talked to a little girl who had Katie Ledecky's book with her and she was hoping to get it autographed. I know it just about melted your heart. And I think I heard later that Katie Ledecky did find her. Oh, and I have no it, doubt. You know, cause, cause she's like that, but the audience is just full of kids like that who are, Maybe it's a swimmer connected with their club because there are so many, you know, like there's there's so many swimmers here. There's like 900 swimmers. There are clubs from all over the U.S. represented. And it's just amazing to see the turnout and the excitement that is here for this race. Nighttime beyond the final. I just You have the crowd, which is incredibly loud. You have music. You have this light show that goes on in between everything. The swimmers walk out from behind this digital board, which is 70 feet tall. In the back, there is a green screen where they can do poses and stuff so they can use that for the walkout. When the medal ceremony happens, because the winner gets a medal, and I I think they bring the, the next two out, but they don't hand everybody a medal, but the winner rises from below deck. Like Taylor up. Swift at a yes, concert? Yes. It's amazing. They get their medal from another Olympian. Gretchen Walsh won the 100 meter fly. She got her medal from Dana Vollmer. I know. (laughs) Yeah, it seems like in the little snippets that I've seen on social media, a lot of Team USA swimmers are there. The swim community in the United States, we know just from our brief encounters with them, are very tight and very aware of their history. And it seems like a lot of those people are in Indianapolis with you. 
Yeah, it's incredible. And then when they have the medal ceremony, they also make all of the screens, the fascia screens around the stadium and the overhead jumbotron are all golden and that reflects on the water and it's just like you you get it you get the feels it's they make this so special and so exciting i I mean i can't imagine the olympics can top this to be quite honest (laughs) it's amazing and this sounds so usa swimming yes yes there's something about usa swimming that is very very special and it's one of those federations that has some cash and knows how to spend it to really make these events just sparkle. Yeah. It, so the the meet itself is amazing. The stadium is amazing. Everybody behind the scenes is just thrilled with it. And they should be. It's They put a ton of work into it. It looks great. It looks like it swims really well. We've already had one world record here. I, I will say that in person, from my angle, it doesn't look like they swim very fast. <laughs> <laughs> you you see but that's honestly so funny because most sports in person seem much faster i know but there's something and i bet it's because i'm sitting at an end and it might be better and you just like everybody's going fast so you're just like well this is the speed right and, and i honestly i know this is very embarrassing but i did go for a swim for a first swim in a long time and I was doing at my YMCA and I was doing some sprints breaststroke because that's my stroke and I'm like oh I could do a length of the pool in 30 seconds and then they were doing a 100 meter breaststroke I'm like oh Jacoby is just under 30 seconds for a length I could do that and then I realized oh wait I was doing a 25 yard pool (laughs) she was doing a 50 meter so yeah uh, that makes a little more sense master swimmer chill (laughs) i I still got it but you know who still has it is gabrielle rose who at 46 years old made the semi-finals in the 100 meter breaststroke she actually she didn't make it out of the semis but she made it into the alternates group for the finals just in case because there's something about here's who's made the finals let us know and and they announce let us know your intentions within 30 minutes and like oh i guess they have to confirm that they want to swim because maybe somebody got injured or whatever but they always have two behind that who are ready to go at a moment's notice i did get into her mixed zone after she got into the semifinals, and she said she was i mean so proud a first off being 46 she swam at atlanta 1996 and sydney 2000 and had been swimming masters. It was like, you know, I'm I'm doing well. You're making the I... qualifying time for the trials. Why yes. not? Why not see what I got? And she was amazed to get into the semifinals. She looked good. Somebody asked her in the mixed zone about her. It, it was kind of a surprise that she was doing breaststroke now. And she said, you know, that was my original stroke. And I lost it when I was like 12. And that's, I know. And it, I mean, it helped when she, she did the IM for a long time. That was one of her events in both Olympics. And she was just really happy that that little girl got to swim breaststroke at an elite level again. And that was really touching. My mix on tape is not good quality. I will tell you that right now. It's so loud in there and you've got the pools going. I mean, just the, you don't realize the noise from the pool that is going on that I don't know, there's probably a couple hundred swimmers in there at any given moment. But all the chaos makes it really hard for me to get decent audio. We've got a blog now on our website, flamealifepod.com. So I'll try to get something written up about what she said in that that mix zone. 100 meter breast semifinals, Lydia Jacoby going through. I'm so happy for her. I don't understand what the heat designation is because she is not in the same heat as Lily King. And wasn't in the final heat. She was in the second to the last heat. So I don't know why that happened the way it did. But she is going through to the finals. Those will be tonight. Punching their ticket to Paris was Carson Foster in the 400 IM. Gretchen Walsh in the 100 meter fly. And Nick Fink in the 100 meter breaststroke. Katie Ledecky has already won something here. Uh, She and Simone Manuel going through to the finals in the 200 meter free. Which will be tonight. 
it was so exciting to see Simone Manuel out there swimming. She got huge cheer from the audience, especially when she got out of the pool, uh, just made it in the semifinals. So I am so thrilled that she is in a final again. Uh, she started her semifinal race really strong and other swimmers got caught up to her at the end. But I'm, I'm curious to see what she brings to the finals. Oh, I want to see her get back to Paris. <clears throat> Carson Foster and Gretchen Walsh both missed Tokyo 2020. So this was just uh, so happy of a story for them. They had gone through some pretty lows. Both had worked with performance coaches and confidence coaches in the last three years leading up to this. And they said that they made a huge difference in their performance. And I've Nick got think some- they talk about because his he and his partner are expecting a baby and it was all father's day. Nick Fink got another father's day, you know, an early father's day guest. So you gotta love the stories that, that come out of swimming. Right. And, and I will say we are close to where they do those little standups at the end. Even though I said it looked like they weren't swimming fast, I know they are working so hard because I can see how heavy he is breathing at the end of these things. All of these swimmers are just like (gasps) American swimming and Australian swimming. And there's a couple other, events in the world where getting on the team is almost harder than what happens at the Olympics. I mean, the hurdle is the trials. Mm -hmm. And then Kirsten Foster said that in his press conference last night, he said, yeah, I've heard that the trials is harder and it's a bigger thing. So I'm, I, I, I just can't imagine what the Olympics does beyond this. One thing, there was some backstroke going on last night. So that it was fun to see the setup of putting the little start bar on the starting blocks. That's a whole thing. So I had come across a social media post, and I apologize for not remembering and making a note of which American swimmer it was. It's a retired backstroker talking about how in Lucas Oil Stadium, they don't have the normal roof like you would at an auditorium or at a training pool. So the backstrokers are pretty much the only ones who are going to be affected by being in this massive stadium. Yeah, and it's interesting also to see the flags they have that designate like five meters to go are on piping that is raised up for all of the events and then lowered for backstroke. But they have this huge jumbotron in the center and on the underside of the jumbotron is a U.S. Olympic logo. So I'm wondering if that is there to help them see what is going on. It is a steady light that they can judge distance from. Right, because they're used to being able to see something. Whereas if you're, you know, you're in Lucas Oil Stadium, you just look up and see space for miles and miles. Right, but I I am betting that because the competition pool is one that you can warm up in as well. So I am betting that they are working very hard to figure out stroke and stroke count. They all know their stroke counts anyway. So they're working to figure out, okay, the stroke gets me to this side of the jumbotron, two or three strokes gets me through the jumbotron and how many strokes out. So yeah, it's, it's going to be curious. I will keep an eye on that because we'll have more backstroke while I'm here. You're there for one more day, two more days, Uh, two more days and maybe into Wednesday. So I'm here tonight. It's Monday. I'm here all day, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm leaving, but I probably will come to the morning session. So we'll have things on social media at Flame Alive Pod in various places. (laughs) Might be a lot of pool. But, oh my gosh, I did take some time yesterday and walk through the Aqua Zone. Indianapolis has gone all out for this. The Marriott Hotel has a huge swimming thing on the side. Those pedestrian walkways between buildings, they have a couple of those that are draped with swimming banners. Uh, There's a huge swimming banner outside on Lucas Oil Stadium banners of different swimmers, including Lydia. So I did take a picture of hers. Then in the convention center, which is just across the street, is the Toyota Aqua Zone. And that is a big fan fest type of thing. Oh my gosh. It is incredible. They had t-shirt giveaway. They had all these activities like... A lot of them are for kids, but there are some adults doing stuff, too. There's a coloring area for, you know, if you need to calm down a little bit. They have a little game that is throw the goggles over the row of the flag line. (laughs) They've got a little basketball. It looks like Papa Shot thing. They've got a huge table for autographs. And just the line to get into the autograph sessions is unbelievably long. 
flanking the autograph tables are on either side. One is for women. One is for men. That is where they're putting the names of everybody who's made the team so far. Right. They have this giant American flag made out of the lane lines that's hanging from the wall. Oh, that's and I think clever. Toyota has this whole setup in the middle. Of course, they have cars and they're wrapped in swimming stuff. So like Caleb Dressel is on a car. <laughs> but they have a little area of try it sports. And they have a tiny little basketball court with it's just a, a regulation size basket and then a shorter basket for kids. But it's for wheelchair basketball. So you can try wheelchair basketball, right? They have a little speed skating area with a big cutout of Aaron Jackson. You put on booties over your shoes and you can do the, the speed skating slides. They have a little inflated curling, like half sheet, where you've got these curler curling stones that are on wheels. It's 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 almost like the uh, whiteboard or whiteboard. The remember that hard surface curling that we did at the hundred days out to oh, Pink? Oh yeah, it is like it's, a whiteboard. It's, yeah, it's a material. little bit like that, but but it's got inflated bumpers around it so that the things don't go off there is a very short little track that kids can run down it may be like 40 meters and of course like oh this is perfect to get energy out of your kids they can try track which actually translates into parents would actually like to sit and watch the race <laughs> right so let's There's tire them out a, a tiny little area for hockey and they've got a little sled hockey on wheels there that you can get into it's a really cool setup for that, uh, there's some other booths of stuff around, like Swimming World magazine is here, and there's other types of products. Speedo has a huge area that's got like a goggle Hall of Fame wall on it, and they've got a little display with some of the advances and, you know, when goggles got into the Olympics and things like that. And then it, it, there's a massive store here. You can go and buy some goggles in the store and then customize them all at the Speedo booth. So you can pick out the rubber thing that goes around your head. You can pick out what the nose bridge looks like. You can pick out what the, the lenses are like, if they have different reflectance in them or shading in them. You can pick out some of them have designs around the rim of the goggle. It oh, is yes. so cool, right? It is so amazingly cool. Those are $45. It's very tempting. I will tell you that. Every sports manufacturer is here with a massive amount of clothing and accessories. And and then there's Team USA gear here, too. I have seen the Visa bags that they have. They don't have athletes on them. One side says Paris and the other side says 2024. And they're kind of a springy colors like blues and light blue and green and yellow. Then in the wandering through the store, which I didn't spend a ton of time in because it was time to move on. Those long coats that swimmers wear when they come out, five hundred dollars. A tier one was five hundred bucks. And I bet way too long for either of us. <laughs> Probably. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the Aqua Zone. Then they've got like a three block stretch of downtown all blocked off with a a sixty seven foot Eiffel Tower, sixty six foot Eiffel Tower replica that they've built here. There's other different photo ops. So the Purdue University giant marching band drum is here and they have a couple of other displays that are obvious for taking selfies or getting photos taken. They have a little starter flag area from the Indy 500 that you can walk up and wave all the flags. And then they have concerts every night. So they've got a whole little stage set up. There's one area and i have to go back and wander down this to see if there's more streets named but there was one area i saw oh hey this is babasoff street yeah and they renamed home. a bunch of streets for yeah. swimmers so there was phelps and um i think there was an elizabeth bicel there was a whole bunch that they uh and dana name. volmer has a street those are the two i saw were babasoff and volmer and like oh this is cool but i didn't see any others i was surprised there's a speedo cafe <laughs> that you can get food at. I think. Can you wear your Speedo to the Speedo Cafe? We should call Tony Acevedo, <laughs> our water polo friend who said he has gone to dinner in a Speedo. And I've get not that seen experience. that. I've not seen that yet, but I would not be surprised either. 
So it is an amazing spectacle. If you are down here, if you are anywhere near here, I would try to come, to be quite honest. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun. It gets you in the mood for Paris for sure. So, uh, yeah, put swimming on the list. Definitely. I know you want to see Adam Peaty. I do. But, yeah, both of us have to get to the pool at some point just to see what this is like. But uh, thank you to USA Swimming for letting me in. And uh, it's great practice and great, great way to get excited about the games. We've got a little IOC news left over from last week's executive board meeting. The executive board has voted to propose to the IOC session that they should create an Olympic esports games. The one that the sort of the trial run that they did last year mm-hmm. was very successful. So maybe this makes sense. Yeah, I'm very curious about this because they have been doing some esports stuff and uh, I mean, this is all happening very, very quickly, extremely quickly for a body like the IOC to make some change. But they said with the Olympic Esports Week, there were 500,000 people around the world that took part in some way or watched it. And to them, that was a great measure of success. There were 100, just 150 participants there. So I'm very curious as to what kind of event they want to make, how long they want to make it. And I also wondered if this was a, we need something else for that year in between. That year in between. There always has to be an Olympics going on. Because of the fact that life moves so quickly now. And I'm curious as to how having Paris and having a non-pandemic Olympics will create interest in the Olympic movement again. But I'm also wondering if this is another way to keep the Olympics in everybody's brain for longer. I mean, it's in our brain every day, but I do wonder if they're just like, we got to remain viable. So that will be another thing voted on in at the session ahead of Paris 2024. Welcome to Shuklistan. It is the time of the show where we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests and listeners of the show who make up our citizenship of Shuklistan. Andrew Capo Bianco is competing at the U.S. Olympic Diving Trials on Tuesday, June 18th and Friday, June 21st. In the U.S., all events will be streaming on Peacock and the finals will air on NBC. Track cyclist Mandy Marquardt did not make the U.S. track cycling Olympic team, but this was as expected. If you remember for our interview, she, they didn't get quota spots in her main event, so she hadn't planned on making the team and she was really pushing for LA 2028. You know, it's always kind of a bummer to not see your name on a list, (laughs) but she wasn't planning on going anyway. She is doing a 5K at ADA virtual challenge to raise diabetes awareness and the importance of a healthy lifestyle. The event goes from June 19th through 23rd, and you could join her team and help raise some money for diabetes. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Jacqueline Semino, Megumi Fields, and Daniela Ramirez will be competing at the World Artistic Swimming event, the Hungarian Open, June 20th to 23rd in Budapest. And Lydia Jacoby and Bobby Fink will be still competing here in Indianapolis. It was great to meet Patrick from Chicagoland. Listener Lori was here. I met our paths crossed. She was here on Saturday. I was I was not here on Saturday. And if any other listeners are coming to the to the trials, please let us know in our Facebook group or on uh, socials, and I will be sure to come and find you. And that is going to do it for this episode. Let us know what you think of wheelchair basketball and also if you're watching the swimming trials. Find us on X, YouTube, and Instagram at Flame Alive Pod. Send us an email at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208 352 6348. That's 208 Flame It. You can chat with us and other fans on our Facebook group, Keep the Flame Alive podcast, and sign up for our weekly newsletter with even more Olympic and Paralympic info for you at our website, flamealivepod.com. On Thursday, we will hopefully have the U.S. Olympic fencing team. (laughs) I got some editing to do this week. (laughs) So be on the lookout for that because Allison had a great time at Fencing Media Day and got a ton of wonderful audio. So we are looking forward to bringing that to you. And please do not forget to tell a friend about the show. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.